These are Kevin and Mike. They have made one billion dollars within a year and a half. Here is how it went. On October 6, 2010, they launched a small new iPhone app which focused on photo sharing, Instagram. In only three months, they had over one million users. Less than two years after its launch, Instagram had over 27 million users. Just for reference, it took Facebook almost twice the time to reach the same number of users. Next, Instagram was acquired by Facebook for $1 billion. Today, Instagram has over 80 million users and still growing. And here's the even more amazing thing. It had almost no advertising, no campaigns. Instagram had spread as if on its own. This is what a successful trend feels like. Coming out of the blue and sweeping everyone off their feet. We see trends like this not only in mobile apps. We see them in technology, in fashion, in social protests, in celebrities adopting kids from third world countries, in spiritual trends. In fact, even TED is a trend. It's an idea about spreading ideas that has spread without any advertising or campaigns to millions of people watching the talks, attending the conferences. If we think about it, each and every one of us has an idea, a product, a technology, a behavior, a way of thought we would like to spread just like this, like wildfire, among our consumers, our users, our customers, our employees, our community, even our own private circle of friends. In other words, in a sense, we would all like to create trends. And this is what fascinates me. How are trends created? How do they spread? The answers are not obvious. I have been researching this area for the past eight years, and it is an intriguing yet mysterious process. It depends on many factors, not all of which we know and understand. However, we do know some important facts about trends that have been accumulated in research throughout the years, and today I'm going to share four key factors that are common in successful trends. So, what makes the difference between a regular product or idea and one that becomes a trend? The first factor is that your product must provide real value, a practical benefit. Can you guess what are the New York Times' most shared, most viral articles? You may guess it's breaking news or business news or sports. Everyone likes sports, right? But no. Jonah Berger and Catherine Milkman recently found that the most shared articles were about dining, technology, and education, the most useful ones providing practical benefit. It should be a simple benefit, simple to understand and simple to use. Instagram made it simple to take pretty pictures and share them. TED is basically a simple-to-use database of ideas. The iPhone and iPad are so simple to use that even my three-year-old niece knows how to swoosh and even my friend's kittens play catch the fly. <laughs> but there are millions of practical, simple apps out there. Most of them didn't succeed like Instagram. And that's because many of them missed the second factor, which is that the idea needs to appeal to us, non-rational human beings. I have explored hundreds of trends and realized that this is one of the main reasons we adopt trends. A relentless search for identity. Who am I? How do others perceive me? How would I like others to perceive me? How do I perceive myself in comparison to others? What my research shows is that even if we don't really like admitting it, the question of how we are perceived either by ourselves or by others, is very significant to our behavior. If you want something to spread socially, it must also provide an identity benefit to the user. This is the second factor. What does it say about me when I'm using Instagram, when I'm using the new iPhone version? What does it say about you when you're posting that brand new innovative TED Talk on your Facebook wall? We all look for identity benefits that enable us to better understand and express our identity. 
We do that with the brands we use, the cars we drive, our houses, the friends we choose, and in many other aspects of our lives. But what I suggest is that in the special context of trends, this identity factor is even more interesting. When we adopt trends, we are actually trying to reach a very delicate balance between two opposing forces. On one hand, we have a very basic evolutional human need to belong to a group that accepts us, appreciates us, gives us this social security and status of belonging. On the other hand, as members of Western society, we also have a very profound need for uniqueness, for individualism. <laughs> It's a paradox. We want to belong, yet we want to remain unique. In fact. What we really, really, really want is to be different, like everyone else. <laughs> It is a very complex balancing act, and adopting trends enables us doing just that. I once did an experiment with eight to twelve-year-olds. I went into the classrooms and told them I was going to give them the option to choose their own reward for participating. We showed them several necklaces and asked them to mark their choice. After conducting the educational experiment, I told them I was now giving them the option to change their initial choice. On the screen, we showed them the necklaces and a list indicating who and how many chose each necklace. It was amazing. You could clearly see how the popular kids, noticing that most of the followers chose the exact same thing they did, immediately changed their choice to something else, more unique. However, they did not choose anything too different. They chose something within the same style, but with a slight variation, different like everyone else. We see this very strongly with kids, with teenagers. On one hand, they are really deeply into finding their own unique identity, but at the same time, they are really obsessed with their friends and their social belonging. That's the time where the tension between the two forces is the strongest, and that's why kids and teenagers are so affected by trends. But it is not just kids. Since then, I have given many talks about trends, about youth, to MBA students and managers and CEOs, and I noticed that every time I get to this different, like everyone else part, these grown-ups are all fascinated. They're all sitting there, nodding their heads and smiling with agreement. Oh yes, we know the feeling. It's not just kids. We all want just that: to be unique without taking a risk, to belong. Without losing our identity, different like everyone else, it is a very delicate balance. If you want your trend to spread socially and survive on the long term, create variations, new options, keep innovating, just like Apple did with the iPhone, so that people will be able to belong to the group that adopts a trend yet remain unique. So, when planning your trend, make sure you have a practical benefit. And an identity benefit, and if this identity benefit can also be observable to others, such as the way the kids' necklaces were observable to their friends, Instagram produces very distinct pictures, the sharing options of the online TED talks, then you're a whole step ahead. But how do you communicate these benefits? This is where the third factor comes in. What do you tell people about your new idea, your new product? What do you tell your investors, your consumers? What do you share on your Facebook, your Twitter, on your TED Talk? How do you do that in this digital era of collective ADD? Add into the equation the fact that most of our ideas might be really nice, but they're not jaw-dropping. Well, to anyone but our loving mothers, and there are just so many ideas out there. How do you turn your product or idea into a message that spreads, that sticks? What makes a message viral? After researching thousands of sticky and viral messages, Chip Heath, Dan Heath, and Jonah Berger have identified some interesting highlights in the viral message magic. Your message must be a story. This is the third factor. We love stories. We understand and remember them without even noticing. The TED message is a story. 
ideas worth spreading. But not every story spreads. The TED message is a simple story that draws our attention. Imagine yourself seeing this for the very first time. For me, it was fascinating. All of this, conference, audience, applications, just to spread ideas. What are these ideas that are so worth spreading? And it's hard work creating this kind of story. The TED Talks you hear are seldom the speaker's first draft. Every speaker at TED has spent tens of hours on finding his own story, worked with the best coaches TED provide, done hundreds of rehearsals just to capture your attention, to make you feel something. So take these practical and identity benefits and turn them into a story, a simple story that would draw people's attention. But how do you spread this story socially so that it reaches everyone? This is where the fourth factor comes into play, the social distribution of trends. The people who invent the new things, the new trends, the trend creators, they are only 1% of the population, and usually the new things they invent does not spread on its own. But research shows there are two special types of people that differ on the balance between uniqueness and belonging, and they can help you spread your trend. Meet Tevi Gevinson. At the age of 11, Tevi started writing a fashion blog named The Style Rookie. This is how she described herself. She said, I'm a tiny dork that sits inside all day wearing awkward jackets and pretty hats. Cute. She was soon featured on the New York Times magazine. By 13, she was a special guest at the New York Fashion Week. By 14, she was named a Voguista by Vogue Italy. By 15, she founded a magazine. Today, Tevi is only 16. She's the inspiration of many and a very influential person. Tevi Gevinson is a trendsetter. Trendsetters are brave and crucial since they are the first to adopt your new trend. They adopt something simply because they like it and they don't care what anyone else thinks. In the balance between uniqueness and belonging, they have a higher need for uniqueness and a lower need for belonging. They may be celebrities, artists, wealthy people, designers. In the early days, these were the royalty, the clergy, the merchants. But in this era, just like Tavi, trendsetters don't have to be rich or famous. Some of us are just trendsetters by nature. Remember in high school, the popular kids may have gotten all the attention, but the real trendsetters were the ones sitting on the side wearing their own funky style. They didn't care about fitting in. They don't care about what's fashionable. They adopt something because they like it. In the necklaces experiment with the kids, it was so easy to see. In each class, we had these one or two kids sitting in the side in their own seats, and they didn't even consider changing their initial choice. They knew what they liked, and they didn't care what anyone else chose. But apparently, very few of us are like those kids. Trendsetters are only 5% of the population. And that is why, for the social distribution of trends, we also need the trend followers. The trend followers are also willing to try new things, but they need to see others adopt first. The trend followers has a balance that is a bit more towards the belonging. Trend followers are 10% of the population. They may only have a few hundred followers on Facebook and Twitter, but there are many more of them. They are the ones who turned Instagram from a 1 million users application to a 30 million users application within a year and a half. They are the ones that really connect us to the rest of the population. Those are the people who share the TED Talks, post them on the Facebook, email them to their friends. They have spread TED to over 1 billion views. And this is how even an abstract idea such as TED becomes this global inspiring trend. I believe, I believe that each and every one of us has something that is really worth spreading. It may be an abstract idea such as TED, a product, a technology, something you would like people in your workplace or community to do or embrace, a national thing, a regional trend, even a global peace process. 
we all have something worth spreading. And I don't think you necessarily need big agencies or big budgets to spread it. I have seen over and over again how powerful these trend factors can be. Make sure you have a practical benefit and an identity benefit. Turn them into a story, tell your story to the trendsetters, and do not forget the trend followers. With this knowledge, we can really move things. You have the idea. Make it spread. Thank you.